Welcome to the Modern Ministry Podcast, where key issues in contemporary ministry are discussed. The Modern Ministry Podcast is a weekly podcast put on by the John W. Rawlings School of Divinity at Liberty University. Our school exists to come alongside the local church in its quest to fulfill the Great Commission, and we hope that the content here in this podcast helps you do just that. Dr. Holshoff, thank you for joining us on the Modern Ministry Podcast this week. Thanks for being here and helping us think through some of these difficult issues. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all. Yeah, so, so this week, I think what you're helping us think through is how to approach disability ministry, how to approach talking about disability ministry, common misconceptions. And this has been an area of interest for your, of yours for quite a while can you tell us what got you interested in this area in the first place? Yeah, basically, my wife and I have one son. Uh, his name's Connor. He was born with infantile epilepsy. And so mm. basically, it means that somewhere in the womb, he his brain was supposed to kind of, the neurons in his mm. brain were supposed to sort of go like that, and yeah. his just sort of mm, and got stuck together. Yeah. Uh, and so he had cortical dysplasia is the medical term to for it. And so we spent first two years of his life um, trying to treat it, mm. uh, trying everything he could throw yeah. at it at that time to... Uh, to to stop it, to prevent the seizures. Uh, nothing really worked, um, but we were told early on the good part to his condition, as opposed to some people who are diagnosed with epilepsy, is that all of his epileptic brain tissue was yeah. on one side. Okay. And so they said what the advantage is for that is that we could always go in and remove half of his brain when he's old enough. And so when he was two years old, mm-hmm. after everything we tried to get it under control, Nothing had worked, and so when he was two years old, we made the the choice. We yeah. made the medical decision to have uh, basically the right half of his brain removed. Wow. What they did was they left the front and back poles in uh, for stability. They took right. out the middle section, uh, they took out this section here, yeah. uh, and then severed the connection between the right side and the left side. So my son really has does life on a, on a half, a brain. half a brain. So. He's 20 years old right now. Uh, he's kind of all over the place. Some things he's very much like a 20-year-old. Other things he's very much not like a 20-year-old. Hmm. Uh, and so along the way, we've uh, had the opportunity to, to be involved in a lot of things as it relates with disabilities or just sort of see what is being done or what isn't being done with disabilities. And one of the places that it became very clear early on uh, that isn't a place that's prepared for those with disabilities, the majority of them is churches. Uh, they're just not, they haven't thought it through, they haven't considered what does this look like, and parents are sort of left to sort of figure out how to make their own way yeah. in a church that may or may not be ready, willing, or able uh, to do anything to help or to come alongside, to support, uh, and so it became uh, definitely a, a personal interest. It also then translated into an academic interest. I yeah. teach a class here, Theology of Suffering and Disability. Um, it's also a professional interest. I'm a I'm a board member for a disability organization called the Banquet Network. Mm. Uh, work with them as they help churches uh, establish disability ministries. Uh, and it's also the area that my doctoral studies was done in. So yeah. um, it's, it, it sort of hits a lot of different levels uh, in my life as far as uh, interest level. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And I'm sure in large part as you're approaching this academic question, having so much personal experience coming into it, shapes and informs the way you reflect on the tensions here, especially within the church and a place that should be, you would, we would imagine as Christians, a place of belonging and love and hope and connection. But you mentioned a lot of times the church doesn't seem to be prepared for that conversation. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think it just, I, I think it's just not something the church has really thought through. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes it's, it, it, it's not really that like, here's my front burner issues or here's a thing. And it's really not there. I think a lot of times churches discover the need for disabilities simply because a parent says, Hey, so we're coming here. Um, you know, I got a son, he's in eighth grade. He wants to participate in middle school. We're not sure what that looks like. And they bring it to the pastor and the pastor says, well, let me get the middle school pastor in and we'll see what we can talk about. And I really think it that from a leadership perspective, uh, there's so much that church ministers, that pastors, that church leaders are, are involved in that it's not willfully like, oh, I don't really care. It's just there's so much going on, it's easy to overlook yeah. uh, certain needs within the church. And one of those being, what does disability ministry look like? That makes a lot of sense. I also wonder from some previous conversations we've had, if part of what goes on here is a 
a difficulty in even thinking about how to relate to the question. How do you use language? How do you use words? How do you imagine this issue playing out in our world? Do you discuss this as, a, as an issue of normality or, abnorm or is this an abnormal world where the fall has stepped in and caused problems? And so in that, how should we imagine the reality of disability in our world around us theologically, informed by the story of scripture, and what are some ways you've seen that this doesn't play out well among Christians and, and just among the world? Otherwise? Yeah, and I think there's a couple ways to look at it. First, I think we could talk about the reality of disability, and I yeah. think one of the best ways to, to look at the reality of disability is if you consider uh, the tree of life, right? Yeah. The tree of life sort of can serve as bookends in Scripture. You see it in the garden, uh, and around that tree of life, there is no sin, there is no disability, there is no suffering. No none of the none yeah. of the impact of all of that is there, right? And then skip to the end of the book, the tree of life shows up in the eternal kingdom, and the tree of life is mentioned there. And once again, you are in a place where there's no disability, there's no suffering, there's no sickness, there's no death. Uh, and the the effect of the 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 call uh, the the effect of the fall the curse has been removed, mm. right? And so, but we find ourselves living between the trees. We yeah. find ourselves somewhere between the tree of life in Genesis and the tree of life in Revelation. And so that really helps us understand that there's nothing uh, there there's nothing normal yeah. about where we live. And so that mm. then how you respond to that. There's really three ways that people yeah. often that sort of we responded to that as a culture, and then uh, if we think through it biblically. So let me give you the first one, and sure, then we can sure, sure, kind sure. of bat that around a little bit. Um, so the historical view would say something like this, and this is um, one of the, the people who writes in this space is active at, uh, who's active in this space is uh, Stephanie Hubach. And yeah. So she kind of phrases it out this way. She said that there's a historical model, and in this historical model, what you see is that uh, disabilities are an abnormal part of life in a normal world. The okay. world is normal, but disabilities are abnormal. And so when you run into a disability, whether it's, uh, whether it's something like epilepsy or Downs yeah. or Asperger's or autism, uh, regardless of the disability, recognize that that's abnormal and the world is normal. Hmm. So that's sort of the historical okay. model. But as much as it stands as a historical model, you still see that today where disabilities are treated as abnormal mm. rather than normal. What would an example of that be? Uh, perhaps one of the best examples yeah. of that, and you see it show up time to time uh, in, in, in articles, newspaper articles, in, uh, in blog posts online, but the Scandinavian countries currently today that are, uh, are doing their best to uh, rid rid yeah. their countries of Down syndrome, and yeah. so uh, active, uh, active, aggressive testing uh, to say, "Hey, listen, mom, what you need to know is that that child you have has Downs, and the best way we think you should treat it is to get rid of it." And so yeah. uh, there was an article the other day that said basically this country has solved the problem of of Down syndrome, and I thought, well, that's going to be interesting. What did they do? And then you read it, and you think they haven't solved it; they're just killing, killing the babies. Yeah. That's not solving that, and but by calling it a problem that needs to be solved, you said it's abnormal, and the world is normal. And so that's the historical. Yeah, model. and I guess there's a lot. There are a lot of historical examples of something like that. I think back to sort of antiquity when you had Greco-Roman cultures that would do the same thing. After a baby was born, if it didn't live up to the standards they expected of their kids, they would leave it out to die. And, the, and Sparta is famous for this, right? Yeah. The the idea of this perfect child that they wanted and anything that didn't meet their expectations was left out to die. And they saw this as a virtuous kind of act because these were abnormalities in a normal world and they were driving for normality. And so what, what are some other ways then that we've seen this Well, if you out? spin it the complete other way, uh, Hubach would call it the postmodern view. I think it's just better to summarize it or best to summarize it, just saying it's the contemporary model. Yeah. Uh, contemporary view is basically this, that disabilities are a normal part of life in a normal world. The okay. world is normal. Disabilities are a normal part of life. And so what ends up happening with that view is that 
Uh, the goal or the hope of that view, it's a normal part of life in a normal world, is that you celebrate the individual, that we'll mm -hmm. celebrate the individual. We're not, they're not abnormal, they're normal, and so we'll celebrate the individual. Without even really thinking about any of the situation. Yeah, we're exactly. Celebrating. With, okay. yeah, we'll just okay. celebrate the individual, and that'll help us celebrate the individual because we'll focus on the individual, not the disability. And ignore the disability. Yeah, but what ends up happening with this view is that you don't actually end up celebrating the individual you end up celebrating the disability. Okay. And so you end up still with a focus on disability rather than the individual. Interesting, interesting. So what's an example of that taking place? Uh, so we see this all the time. Um, so uh, it's, and I'm, I, I, I could cite numerous examples yeah. of this, but I'll use the football one. So it's the, it's the example where, uh, you know, there's a, a kid, let's just say his name's Philip, and he's got Down syndrome, and he's been the manager of the high school football team uh, varsity football team for the four years he's been involved in that school. Never played really because of his disability, yeah. can't play, uh, but he really loves football, loves the, the, the guys on the team, loves the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so there, that's, that's, that's him. He loves what he's doing. And it's usually the players, not the coach. I've, I've very, see, rel, very seldom seen it the other way. It's usually yeah. the players come to the coach and they say, hey, you know, Phillip's done this for four years. Can we talk to – this is the last game of the season. This is the last time he's going to be yeah. on the field. Can we talk to the other coach and call the last play? We'll put Philip in the uniform, and then we'll just call a running play. We'll hand off to him. We'll make it look like we're tackling. We'll leave a nice wide hole so he can run through it, and then he'll and they'll go to the other coach. I've never heard a coach go, nah, we're not going to yeah. do that. And so the last play of the game, for the whole game, Philip's dressed up like, hey, yep. you can put on a uniform. And so Philip is there, and the last play of the game, they line Philip up. They hand the ball to Philip. Philip finds the hole and he's gone for 30 yards of touchdown. Everybody celebrates yep. the, the home team and the away team. It's just a giant celebration, but it's a dishonesty of sorts, but it, right? yeah, it's a yeah. giant dishonesty of sorts. And, and, and the, cause the reality is, would you do that? If you, if it was a no cut team, right? Yep. Like nobody gets cut. And so there's a guy named Steven on the team. Who's terrible. He, if, if this was a cut team, he wouldn't make the team, Yeah, but he makes a team because it's a no cut team. And now he's on the team. Would you do that for him? Yeah. No, we wouldn't do it for him. And if you went to their coach, you go, hey, this guy's lousy. He's terrible. But, you know, he's been here Let's all year. Let's give him a chance. Let's just give him a chance. The coach is going to be like, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Right? And so what ends up happening is we say, well, we, we, we just want to celebrate the individual. But what ends up happening is you're so focused on the disability that you end up celebrating the disability and not the individual. And we see that all over. I mean, that's the, the prom yeah. king and prom king and prom queen example, right? Like, hey, we're going to name the our prom king and prom queen this year are going to be so and so and so and so. And, you know, they're, they're two kids who are in our high needs classroom. And it'd just be really great if they were involved. And then what happens? Well, okay, yeah, they're named prom king and queen. But what did you do with them for the last four years? Yeah. You avoided them. You didn't invite them. When were they ever invited to, to your football game party or your you know when were they invited to this activity or that activity they're just not active they're not invited at all and then yeah for one moment we're like oh yeah let's make them prom king and queen and the only people that feel good about that oftentimes is us yeah right because oftentimes unless a, 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 an, an adolescent has the ability to think through what's being done they miss what's being done Right, I'm being used in this moment to make somebody else feel, feel good. good. It's really not about me. They've treated me like dirt for four years. I, it's been or non-existent for four years. Wow. Right, but now in one moment on a Friday night in the last hurrah of the school year, you're going to name me prom king and prom. If it if that was my son, and someone said, "Hey, I'm going to say no, yeah. no, please don't." Unless that that school had demonstrated throughout the year that they thought of the him years, as that they thought the prom of him, king, they yeah. thought of him and as included someone, him yeah, that he invited was, him to the parties, brought yeah. him in, treated him with community. Yeah, but he, no, he's not a prop for you to use at the end of the year, so you feel well, and that's the that to me really highlights that contemporary model where what you end up with is, well, it's a normal part of life in a normal world and we're just going to celebrate the individual. Yeah, but what ends up happening is you actually celebrate and honor the disability rather than the individual. I wonder if part of that is, and I mentioned the dishonesty earlier, when you treat it and you, outwardly, your whole conversation, your language, everything you want to put forward as your face says this is normal and you don't want to talk about abnormality at all but it's but there is a difference and then you you let it rise to the surface sometimes in these moments of celebration to make yourself feel better 
you're recognizing a difference, an abnormality, but you're not actually willing to articulate it or to think about it. And so there's this sort of dishonesty, this veil over our eyes that then pops up at moments and leads to these situations where we're making ourselves feel better by, oh, yeah, we'll select them as prom king or them as prom queen. Um, I wonder if that dishonesty and that difficulty with language is a huge part of what's driving this. Yeah, uh, but the other thing I would think is language is definitely a part of that. Yeah. But I think the, the reality is what drives those two views is something that makes the Christian view completely different. Yeah. Right? In the Christian view, what we would say as we look at this is, first of all, that the world isn't normal. We would acknowledge, and so the, where it's Christians abnormal. begin is completely different. We would say, this world is not normal. So their historical view says the world's normal, with a contemporary view says the world's normal. Christians come in and say, no, the world isn't normal. This is not as it was designed to be. Yeah. This is not as it was created to be. The world is not normal. The world is abnormal. Hmm. And then to that then, it allows the, the believer, it allows the Christian to say, disabilities are a normal part of life in an abnormal hmm. world. It happens with a high degree of regularity, but it is a normal part of life in an abnormal world. And so when we recognize that this world is abnormal, it changes a couple things for us. What it does is it recognizes then that we're all broken people living broken lives surrounded by other broken people in a broken world. In other words, brokenness is not just that person with a disability. It's all of us. It's all of us. It's the world that we live in. As beautiful as the sunrise is, as beautiful as the sunset is, it's a broken sunset. Yeah. Right? Paul says creation groans. Right? And I think sometimes we're, the created world is still so beautiful yeah. that we miss the fact that it's still broken. Yes. Right, And that sunset is spectacular, but it's broken. That sunrise is beautiful, but it's broken. And so we, we lose track of that, I think, and we, and we don't recognize how fundamentally broken things are. Yeah. And so what happens is then I recognize it's not the disability person, the individual who has a disability yes. who's broken, and I'm not, we're both broken, okay. right? And so that changes the way yes. in which I approach them. Why? Because I recognize, look, their brokenness may yes. be more visible than mine. My son's brokenness is way more visible than mine, but we're equally broken. Yes. We're equally broken, right? And so because of that, it, it changes the way that I respond to them. Mm. Uh, at the best, one of the things I think about is uh, Biddy and Bo's, the coffee shop that's, uh, that sort of uh, is, is kind of coming up the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a great coffee shop. Uh, by and large, they hire uh, mm -hmm. individuals with a disability to work the coffee shop. Uh, but oftentimes what those individuals will wear is a T-shirt that says, I'm not broken. Mm. And they have to wear that T-shirt because culture looks at them and says, you're broken and I'm not. But the reality is every morning you and I get up and we put on yes. other clothes to cover the T-shirt that's stapled to our body because of yep. the fall that says, I am broken. I am broken. And if we properly saw each other, we would recognize that we're all equally broken. Some of our brokenness is more visible than others, but we're all equally broken. So our, our brokenness is normal in an abnormal world for each of us, for yes. each and every one of us, we're broken. Yeah, and then the other part of that that this allows us to do then when we recognize the brokenness of the world yeah. or the, the, the abnormality of the world and that disability is a normal part of life in an abnormal world is it also lets us then as believers to talk about the Imago Dei, that yes. we're imagers of God. And so when I understand that I'm an imager of God and that all individuals, regardless of ability or disability, are imagers of God, then it changes how mm. I approach them, right? And so often what happens if we take this, you know, uh, I'm not broken and you are broken, yes. it becomes a ministry down to. In other yeah, words, you're okay. the least of these and I'm not. And so let me minister down to you, mm. right? And so you never actually come alongside them. You're always ministering down to them. Why? Because... I'm broken and you're not, and or you're broken yeah. and I'm not. I'm the normal one, you're yes. the abnormal one, or, or however you're going to frame that out. But the difference is the brokenness is greater in you than it is in yeah. me. You're yeah, you're the least of these and I'm not, yeah. versus coming alongside an individual and saying, listen, we're, we're all equally broken. Your brokenness may be more visible than mine, but we are all equally broken because of the fall, because of the abnormality yeah. of the world that we live in. But here's the thing, what we have in common 
is also that we're imagers of God. And what mm. that does is it allows me to come alongside of you and walk the journey with yes. you. From a church perspective, it allows me to minister alongside of you rather than seeing people with disabilities as some simply people that, well, we're gonna run this program for them and, and you know we do these things for them in our church. Yeah. And then it never really gets beyond that because we just see them as somebody that we're ministering down to rather than involving them in the yeah. full body life of the church so that they're also not only ministering alongside of us, but how about even leading us? Yes. No, I think that, I wonder if a lot of what's happening within the church, as in so many other ways, is that we are imbibing, we're, we're taking on the visions of this that are given to us by culture. Because I, I feel like what you're driving at here is that Christian theology gives us the ability to say that all of us are broken all of us are in need of community and grace and love. And even in our brokenness, because of the Imago Dei, all of us are of infinite worth. The brokenness doesn't take away our worth. The bro brokenness doesn't mitigate our worth. And so we don't have to hide from the fact that we're broken or we don't have to cover it up. All of us are in this position where we need grace. We need the love of God. We are broken and we have infinite worth. And so I wonder if part of the concern even in this conversation, why Christian churches struggle with this is in thinking through the idea that somehow acknowledging brokenness in any of us is they're worried about how that might impact people's view of our like dignity giving, how we give worth and dignity to people. But Christian theology uniquely is giving us this ability to do both, to recognize our brokenness and to recognize the infinite worth of each person. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's really, and it's one of the reasons why the believers, that the church, that Christians have to be more involved in this space because we have the only answer that gives hope. Yeah. Right, we have the only answer that gives hope in this. It, hope is not in you know a, a token celebration at a football game. Hope is not in saying, "Look, the best thing we should tell you to do is you know get rid of your kid because yeah. your kid has a disability." Yeah. Right, like that's there's no hope in those answers. The the only answer that gives hope is the answer that the church has through what Scripture tells us about who we are, and it embraces the fact that we are all equally broken. But it also embraces the fact, as you said, that we are all imagers of God. Yeah. And it's that, it's, it's that that's so unique to the conversation that when the church chooses to sit it out or when the church chooses not to be involved in it or the church thinks, I don't know really what this is going to look like, so unless it's presented to me, you know, I'm just, I'm just not going to, right? And that's where we're missing this because there's, we have the answer that provides yeah. the hope for families, for individuals uh, who have children with disabilities, who maybe are the person who has a disability. We have the hope that is the answer in Jesus Christ for Amen. this in who we are. Amen. Wow. I'm excited about next week when we have you back on to talk about how this plays out practically in the church, ways that we can put this into motion and show this infinite dignity and worth that we're talking about, and how the church can be the hands and feet of Jesus. So, Dr. Holshoff, thank you for joining us on the Modern Ministry Podcast, and I look forward to hearing from you next week. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.